For centuries, men have studied the night sky to fix points for navigation, to determine accurate time, and to ponder on the millions of worlds beyond this small speck we call Earth. To astronomers in the old world, there was always the challenge of that unseen third of the observable universe, the southern night sky. To observe the transit of Venus through the southern sky, Captain Cook sailed into the Pacific in 1769 on a voyage which led to the development of Australia. Today, observatories in Perth, Western Australia and Sydney, New South Wales continue the work of the astronomers who sailed with Cook. The largest observatory in the Southern Hemisphere is at Mount Stromlo near the federal capital of Canberra. With its nine telescopes and other observing instruments, Mount Stromlo, a section of the Australian National University, is second only to the great observatories of Europe and America. It is also a centre of international research and cooperation, as the American Yale Columbia Universities and the old Swedish University of Uppsala have their permanent southern stations there. The director of Mount Stromlo, who is Professor of Astronomy at the National University, heads a staff of astronomers recruited from all over the world. In the library are books on every branch of astronomy. Part of the observatory is the National Time Service, which issues signals for the correction of clocks, the determination of exact positions in mapping and survey work, and for navigation in the southern seas. To maintain the accuracy of its clocks, the time service uses a transit telescope, which remains fixed on a north-south line while the stars pass over it with the rotation of the Earth. Signals from the clocks are registered on a moving tape, together with signals made by the observer tracking a star. The largest telescope is a 74-inch reflector, a huge structure weighing 40 tons with a mirror 11 inches thick, so delicately balanced that movement to a fraction of a degree can be controlled by an operator sitting at the console. In the counterweight are motors which move the telescope to a selected star as it travels across the sky. Other motors track the star and enable long exposure times for photographs of distant celestial bodies. The object of the telescope is to collect as much light as possible. Light from the stars is collected by a mirror 74 inches in diameter in the base. This mirror is curved and focuses the collected light to a second mirror high up in the tube of the telescope. Set at an angle, the second mirror reflects the narrow cone of light into the eyepiece which also contains the camera. From high up on his moving platform, the observer operates the camera, giving directions through a loudspeaker to his assistant on the floor below. That's okay. Now we'll try to get on to the Doradus Nebula. Right ascension, five hours, 39 minutes, minus 69 degrees, 44 minutes of arc declination. There was right ascension, 5 hours, 39 minutes. Declination, 69 degrees, 44 minutes. Yes, here it is now. I'll just give a, a, a touch to bring it into the centre of the field. Yes, that's right. OK now. I'll start the exposure. When the exposed plate is developed, the astronomer's work really begins. 
By examination, he can determine the true position of a star or nebulae, its brightness, color, and size, the nature of its composition, and that of surrounding gases. With the naked eye, we can see about 3,000 stars. With telescopes like the 74-inch, we can see 40 million. But there are millions of stars we cannot see by visible light. In the new science of radio astronomy, we see these stars by radio light. Working in the same manner as the big reflecting optical telescopes, most radio telescopes collect signals from radio stars in dish-shaped aerials, focus them to a central point above the dish, and the concentrated signal is then passed to receivers in much the same way as an ordinary wireless set. As a sound, it is not unlike static. But the strength of the signals recorded on moving graph paper with the time of their reception enables accurate plotting of the region of the sky from which the signals came. Radio signals from space were accidentally discovered by an American telephone engineer in 1931. Light, heat, and radio waves all radiate as electromagnetic waves and move through space at the same speed. Gases in our atmosphere absorb all but a narrow band of visible light. Radio waves are able to penetrate these gases and give us a wider window to the sky. The main centre for radio astronomy in Australia is at the Radio Physics Laboratory of the CSIRO in Sydney. At Fleurs, near St Mary's, New South Wales, two huge crosses spread themselves across the fields. The Mills Cross is a stationary array of many aerials which record a radio star as it passes across the sky. The unique interferometer aerial with 32 dishes in each arm of the cross scans the sun and other radio stars like the beam of a television tube. At Dapto on the coast south of Sydney, windmill aerials track the sun. In all weather they follow it across the sky. The sun, a typical star, so near we actually live in its atmosphere, is of great importance to astronomers. With visible light we can record pictures of huge explosions known as flares seen here at the Arrow, which erupt thousands of miles from the surface of the sun. The atomic particles in these explosions excite gases in the solar atmosphere causing radio signals to radiate from different levels. At DAPTO, the radio astronomers are able to build up a picture of a flare on a cathode ray tube and to measure the strength, position and size of these fantastic explosions. But the work in the field stations only produces a record of signals. At the laboratory, scientists, mathematicians and astronomers build up a picture from their records. From a map of the sun made by visible light and a plan from the scanning telescope at Fleurs, we see that the radio sun is much bigger than the sun we see with our eyes and how enormous are the sunspots and explosions which affect our radio and cable communications. A great advantage of radio astronomy is that it's a 24-hour astronomy. There are just as many stars to be seen during the day when using radio eyes. Radio astronomy can see through the gas clouds past the great masses of interstellar dust. It has pushed the limits of the observable universe to far beyond man's comprehension and has opened a new vista in his quest of reaching for the stars. Mm -hmm.